the dust of the ancient stars that gave us the building blocks of life. We call it the periodic table of the elements. There's 110 squares or 118, depending on which chemist you argue with. We're going to talk about a few important ones. We're going to get rid of the rest, all right? So let's move on with the pharmacology business. Uh, these are the basic building blocks of life. I'll ask you that on a quiz, I promise. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are the basic atoms or elements of life and biochemistry. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The little tinker toy set that we use to build everything. There's others, but these are the important structures. Your notes might talk about lead. I like to talk about gold. Uh, and let's say this gold uh, coin is made of pure gold, and gold is an element. There is an atom called gold. It has gold properties. And the gold coin, we can divide it and divide it and divide it and divide it and divide it into billions and billions and billions of smaller gold specks. And finally, if we try to divide that gold atom, uh, we can't divide it or we end up with a mushroom cloud. It'd be nice to have a mushroom cloud in my pictures. So there comes a point where you can't divide it anymore. And that is the definition of an atom. So in chemistry and physics, the atom is the smallest particle that still characterizes a chemical element. So gold has, if you take a big gold coin, it has certain properties and appearance. You cut it in half, it has the same properties, and you keep dividing it up. They still have the same properties. There comes a point where if you divide that anymore, you're going to have something that's not gold. Atoms are very, 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 very small. Next time you're at the beach, please go to the beach often while you're in this course. That's why we have physical books, e-books that's great, but they don't go underwater. They don't get rained on. They don't suffer well with sand, okay? So take your book, go to the beach, and do this. This is your first assignment, right? I know when you're participating. We're not going to get on time, are we? All right, an atom in a grain of sand is like a grain of sand on Big Beach. So while you're sitting at Little Beach and you take a grain of sand, uh, take a handful of sand and look at a grain of sand and remember that an atom inside of that grain of sand is just like that grain of sand on the beach when you compare it, all right? All right, so atoms have something in the center, a nucleus. It's different than the nucleus of cell, all right? The center of something, they call it the nucleus. The little round thing in the center is a nucleus, all right? If it's positively charged, it's a proton. A positive char if it's negatively charged, uh, it's an electron. So the electron goes around the nucleus, and it's negatively charged. The proton is in the nucleus, it's positively charged. Positives and positives repel, negatives and negatives repel. It's just like magnetism, except it's the right-handed vector, all right? So everything, every type of element or atom is defined by the number of protons. If it has one proton, it's hydrogen. If it has two protons in the nucleus, it's helium. It's just that simple. So how we define the atom is quite simply the number of protons. If you change the number of protons in the nucleus of something, it becomes a completely different atom, all right? Let's take a look at hydrogen. It's right there on the periodic table. I can, they've switched us to high definition, so now I can't see. Oh, the ironies of life. All right, so there's hydrogen right there. Uh, number one on our periodic table. Hydrogen's number one, right? Because it has one proton, and because it has one proton, it supports one electron. So the proton's positively charged. The electron is negatively charged. It'll become more and more important when we talk about ions and charges. All right. Let's compare that to something on the, on the other side of the table is number two. You'd think they'd be next to each other, but it's like we talked about that. Here is helium. It has two protons in the center, so it supports two electrons. It's called an inert atom. All right. Helium is inert. All this stuff's written down for you, so don't get carpal tunnel. We'll put it in your resources section. All right. Just kick back and enjoy. Helium is inert. It doesn't react with anything. All right? Hydrogen reacts with all sorts of stuff. Helium doesn't. Why? By the way, atoms do have neutrons that are neutrally charged or have zero charge. They do not require corresponding electrons. If you have two protons, you're going to need two electrons to support that configuration. All right? Although an element must have a fixed number of protons to be that element, an element can have variable numbers of neutrons. And so there's hydrogen. It has one proton and one electron, just like we defined earlier. Hydrogen, number one. All right. 
Well, if there's another neutron, if there's a neutron in the nucleus, that doesn't make hydrogen different, it just makes it heavier. When people talk about heavy water or heavy isotopes, they're just talking about more neutrons. And those neutrons fall off and decay and are radioactive. You'll hear about iodine-127 and then iodine-131, and it's still iodine, the same old iodine that's in the salt, however, with different numbers of neutrons, okay? So when we talk about isotopes in an atom, we're talking about different numbers of neutrons, okay? And we'll throw the isotope word around in pharmacology and healthcare and the nursing business like you guys are some kind of particle physicists, okay? And you're not, and I know that, and that's why we're going through this, okay? So different numbers of neutrons are the reason atoms have different isotopes. This is hydrogen, but with two neutrons, this is very heavy hydrogen. All right, so we're not going to talk about neutrons. There's the fine print. We're just not going to talk about them. All right. I will ask you that atoms with different numbers of neutrons are the reason atoms have different isotopes. Great. All right. Well, uh, I draw a lot of cartoons in here. I do make these PowerPoint slides. Uh, however, if a proton were the size of a golf ball, or more appropriately, a little guava fruit, uh, and then an electron uh, in comparison would be the size of a peanut, but in an orbit around the size of a football stadium. So when I'm showing you the cartoon of hydrogen, think it's really like, you know, guava fruit there, peanut spinning around far, far away uh, with a whole bunch of emptiness in between. I used to ask this on the test, but too many people didn't like the question. So, but I do want you to know that electrons are really, 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 really fast. Nothing can travel faster, and electrons are so fast, they cannot be shown to be in any one place at any time. You can read all about Heisenberg if you want to know more about that. So they're said to fill an orbital shell, and we can't really pick out where they are, so we just say they're everywhere at the same time. But electrons travel at the speed of light. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. I think that's the point I wanted to make. But it is the orbital energy, it is the orbital energy of the electron that gives the atom its size, all right? If that or electron quit orbiting, then we could collapse something the size of a stadium into the size of a golf ball or a guava. We could actually make it smaller. And so when you read about black holes and giant stars that have been compressed down into the size of nothing, that's why, all right? Because an atom is like a little uh, thing the size of a golf ball with a peanut spinning around it the size of a football stadium. So there's a lot of empty space that atoms take up. All right, back to the pharmacology business. Let's talk about helium and the inert atoms and why they're not in biologic systems so you understand what it is that I'm trying to talk about today. All right, helium and the, all the elements that are underneath helium on the uh, periodic table do not react with anything under except very extreme conditions in a laboratory. Hydrogen, however, the smallest atom, it wants to be like helium, and so its electrons get sad and run away. Right. And it's the electrons wanting to run away that are put to work in biologic systems. I wanted to have a picture of the, the river flowing and a wheel that's driven by the energy of the river. Not appropriate so much for here, but those who know about rivers, the moving water turns a wheel that does work. The wind blows through the windmills and we capture the moving wind to capture energy. Your biologic systems do that. Our biologic systems do that. They capture the energy of these electrons wanting to run away and make a perfect life for themselves because moving electrons is energy. And so what, even though we're talking about biochemistry and we're talking about pharmacology, I want you to think in terms of movement of energy while we're going through this lecture and, and keeping your eyes open too. I have to stay awake through all of this, which is difficult, I assure you. Helium, why are your electrons so happy? Well, it's because electrons want to be in pairs. I wonder where that rule comes from. So electrons want to be in pairs. Single electrons get lonely and they will want to run away. Well, hydrogen with your one proton only supporting one lonely electron, how can we make hydrogen electrons happy? Well, maybe they can share. 
I have three-year-olds, so the word share comes out of my mouth 50 times a day. Not that it works. All right, so here is a hydrogen molecule. It's H2. The abbreviation for hydrogen is H, if you look at the periodic table. And if we take two of them and stick them together, not we, but they, it, whoever, all right, then we have H2. All right, so this is hydrogen gas. Hydrogen ha gas is H2. And now the electrons are able to share their houses with each other, and the electrons are happy, but that does not make them inert. Right, but it makes the hydrogen stable. Right, so now we have hydrogen gas. <clears throat> All right, term molecule. In chemistry, molecule is a defined stable group of two atoms, or at least two atoms, in a definite arrangement held together by strong bonds, covalent bonds. So the molecule is the smallest part of a substance that still retains the property of that substance. We took the two hydrogens and put them together, and that's hydrogen gas made up of two hydrogen atoms. So the H2 is one hydrogen molecule, one hydrogen molecule made up of two hydrogen atoms. Right? The hydrogen molecule has different properties entirely than the hydrogen atom. Anybody interested? In, take chemistry. chemistry. I love my chemistry classes. I loved all my classes except the pharmacology class. <sighs> we try to make it fun. All right, be careful with this hydrogen word. They're going to throw around words like hydrogen ion. That's quite simply a proton. A uh, hydrogen atom is not a stable arrangement. The electron runs away and leaves behind something called a proton, the nucleus. All right, so a hydrogen ion is the same thing as a proton, and you can put a little dash and write acid. Right? Because anything that dumps a proton into the water is an acid. Period. Trust me. All right? I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> Maybe. A hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron, and there's plenty of that going on elsewhere. But around here, that's not a very stable arrangement. Ooh, computer crash. Hydrogen molecule is the two hydrogens. Uh, hydrogen atoms making covalent bonds. Okay, so don't let them throw around these hydrogen words and confuse you like I do. All right, I did say moving electrons is the key to energy utilization. And the reason that inert atoms are not used in biologic systems is because biologic systems must be able to move electrons. We don't put windmills up anywhere where the wind doesn't blow. All right, it's that simple. Well, somebody does, but we don't. Right. Your, your body does things to move electrons so it can capture that energy, just, just like a windmill. Electric power lines, if you've lived near one of them, you might turn out like me, uh, or not. But you might hear them buzz and crackle, and that's just quite simply the sound of electrons moving through the copper wires. Right. So cap moving electrons is energy, and what this lecture is about. Hydrogen gas is very rare in the atmosphere. It's very light. It floats away. However, 75% of the universe, at least the uh, visible universe, the known universe, is hydrogen in its elemental form. All right, those little happy houses, uh, those houses that the electrons live in, they're called valencies. I don't need you to know that, but when they share electrons, when the houses share electrons, and that's called a covalent bond, like a co-ed dorm, covalent bond, means the electrons are being shared. It's very difficult to separate covalent bonds, and so when we read in pharmacology about something that's caused a covalent bond on a receptor, then we know that that's essentially irreversible. Okay, uh, we've talked about hydrogen, and it can make one covalent bond, and hopefully I've kind of explained how that happens. Hydrogen makes one covalent bond. 